Hello and welcome to E4M D2C Revolution. We have with us today a very special guest, Kaushik Mukherjee, the co-founder and chief operating officer of Sugar Cosmetics. Hi, Kaushik. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Soeni. I've been looking forward to this interaction and we've spoken earlier, of course. So thank you. For <laughs> Great. And uh, first of all, congratulations for eight years of sugar. Um, been quite a journey, I guess. I have to pinch myself at times. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we're you... very grateful. I think uh, when you start creating something, uh, you know, you don't really think about uh, scale, valuation, money. You just think people are going to be really excited and love what you're building. And uh, fortunately, we've had that in sugar. There are a lot of our uh, consumers who just come back to us over and over again, chosen us over brands with far bigger marketing budgets and more bigger legacy. So yeah, I'm nothing to complain. Very happy. Super. Uh, can you like give us a quick throwback into so 2015? Sugar started off as a plain D2C brand. 2017, we know it went omni channel, and today it stands with global aspirations. Can we have like a quick throwback into what has it been like for you? So honest throwback, right? So honest throwback uh, is 2015. Uh, Sugar was uh, born out of the conviction and hard desperation to stay alive as a company. Where it, <laughs> we, and, uh, we spent three years in the beauty space. And uh, it just seemed that beauty space and especially the color cosmetic space within the beauty space was ripe for discussion, disruption. And, and I'll tell you why. Because historically, you know, skincare is a much larger market. So everybody focuses on skincare. It's larger, it's, it's bigger, the opportunities there. But when you see the products on your digital screens, maybe your mobile, skincare at the end of the day dissolves in your skin. Whereas makeup, on the other hand, it engages consumers in a different way. I mean, it just lights up pixels on your screen. So we saw that uh, excitement in the audience. And uh, we also felt that the awareness about products was increasing in leaps and bounds. People wanted to know what beyond the legacy brands who were at a mass market uh, price point? What if they spent a bit more? Can they get better products? And I think that's what we just narrowed down. We hunkered down and said, let's just build a better crayon lipstick. Let's just build a better liquid lipstick. And uh, that played in our favor. So, uh, so yeah, that's how it started. And somewhere along the line, our board asked us that, um, you have to decide what you want to be. I mean, obviously, your consumers seem to love you. But uh, do you want to be a large online brand, a D2C brand, or do you want to be a large beauty brand? And uh, I think we were just very high on adrenaline and we said that we want to be a large, large, large beauty brand in India. And uh, we didn't really know much about the offline space. Uh, neither did we end up uh, doing what a lot of people do, just coach somebody senior who can lead a completely different vertical. We sort of try doing it ourselves. So it took time, but um, today, uh, slightly more than half of the, the revenues of the company come from offline retail. So it's a big shift from what we started as, but I think it's for the best because uh, both, we have to win both online and offline to end up challenging the bigger brands. It's great. And, you know, the cosmetic space, the skincare, skincare space uh, has a lot of players... What are your plans as a leader in this space to break through this clutter? Not a leader. Getting there, hopefully. <laughs> um, but I think one of the leaders we may say. One of the so I, I think I think you you make a very fair point. There is so much clutter right now. Everybody just thinks that let's just uh, I have a joke which I crack that you know, wake up in the morning, brush your teeth, book and ola, go to Asan Rao, come back with nail paints with your name printed on it, and boom, that's a brand. So <laughs> It's actually, uh, you know, people say that when everybody's digging for gold, the person who sells shovels makes the most money. I think the people who are making these products are making a lot of money right now. <laughs> so, um, but no, I think I think it's important to un not start with the product. I think it's important to start with the consumer. I think a lot of us, a lot of the brands today, newer brands, I think they start with the product. They say, okay, you know what, what's easiest to make in my budget with a lower minimum order quantity requirement? Nail paints. Great, let's do that. Kajals. Great, let's do that. If I were to launch a brand today, I would ask myself that in a market which is so saturated with like two very, very popular Kajals, how would I ever make a name? I can make a name when there is space to make a name. And I think that's what 
our learning from sugar has been. Uh, liquid lipsticks as a category is very popular today. Back then in 2015, 16, 17, it was not even there. But because we managed to play in that category, there was superior attraction and interest. Today, everybody has one. So it's important to figure out where you want to play it. And that where has to be a space. It's not a price point. Because price point, if you start, if your value proposition is price point in a desired category, it's not a, it, it's, it's not a need category. It's a want category. Then you will eventually keep, you know, you want to do the hold on to the price point. Somebody else will come and offer it something cheaper. So product has a massive play in this. And I would just focus on product 10 out of 10 times if I were to launch a new brand at different times. Okay. Um, so also, you know, I just came across uh, this news of Sugar collaborating with uh, Amazon Prime Video for Made in Heaven. Yes. Where where did this strategy come from or why did this collaboration sort of, uh, where did this idea come from? You know, I'm so happy that my answer is the same as my previous question's answer. It came exactly from our customers because when we uh, mined a lot of what our consumers' interests were, you know, yes, marriage as a theme plays across a large part of our target audience, but we saw something different here. It was marriage, but not the traditional understanding and acceptance of what a marriage uh, can and or should be. So Made in Heaven just fit there in the slot very well. And when we worked with the team and discussed the idea, they were super interested about how we could amplify what their efforts were. I think it fits in, you know, very well. Uh, we also have invested and dabbled in this space earlier. We had a property called Sugar Brides, which we ran for a couple of years. And uh, this is another extension of our uh, interest in this space and I do. I think we're going to continue to build on this so hopefully in 5-6 years uh, Sugar as a brand will be very inextricably associated with the whole wedding space because uh, I don't know it's it's just a lot of colors and joy it's, it's pretty much what Sugar should be and okay let's talk uh, on the you know a broader perspective the entire you know like we spoke there are a lot of players in the cosmetics and skincare space what if what are you perceiving uh the entire space right now as where is it going how much you know you need to put in more efforts etc where where is the cosmetic space going and skincare of course so i think there are two factors that are affecting our industry one is there's premiumization now. so people are trading up now when they trade up Usually, you would expect a lesser known discerning consumer to say, I'm trading up just because I'm getting a perceived larger brand. I mean, I think that's not enough today. People who are trading up want to know why, what they're getting. Is it, is it you know, more responsibly sourced ingredients or is it just better packaging or is it just a better product formulation? They need to know, which is why you'll find call-outs in skincare very common, not so much in makeup. Now, there are significantly popular call-outs in makeup category as well. I mean, we... We call out long lasting makeup because we really feel you want to stand for that given India's weather conditions and everything. So, yeah, I think that's one thing. The second is there's a lot of um, branding also happening for the unorganized market. So, earlier people would buy maybe a kajal or uh, nail paints from any unbranded category. People are more you know, aspiring right now. They want to use the brand they should others use. So, while a mass user goes to a mass stage, mass stage goes to prestige. And prestige goes to premium, unbranded will also go to mass. So there's a massive play over there. It's not a market which we play very actively in, but there's a huge opportunity for that. What about yeah. the tier two, tier three markets? Do you see any untapped potential in those markets as well? Massive. I, I, I you know, we've always, if you've been born and brought up in a metro, unfortunately, you live with the bias that tier two, tier three is not where the money lies. <laughs> that is, that is such a joke <laughs> because when you look at data of the basket size of tier two, tier three, you realize that, see, they, you know, they see the same shows as people in tier one metros. They aspire for the same thing. They get influenced by the same K-pop or, or you know, uh, you know, Western um, trends as the person living in the metros. So the only thing left is access. Internet falls for this access. And that's why when, uh, when e-commerce players have sales, the, I mean, the basket size is pretty much similar across territories. When we opened some of our uh, stores in tier two, tier three cities, we were shocked and surprised. I, I'll give an example. We have 200 stores. Uh, can you random guess <laughs> which is the number one 
Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you four choices. Okay, so there's a uh, number one most selling store which city, which city is in which city. So there's Mumbai, there's Delhi, there's Surat, and there's Bangalore. What would you choose? Mumbai, most likely. Ah, that's what I would have chosen. Yeah, it will blow your mind out. It's it, it, Surat. So after. Damn, is it? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, right? So yeah, so so we are also learning, uh, and we have to keep learning because the consumer is changing very rapidly. There's the 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 divide is very very fine. And and what about you know? Uh, the let's talk about the digital side of it, right? So, uh, when you digit D two C brand, they're all big on uh, digital and everything. What is Sugar's digital strategy or the mantra to uh, you know a bang on digital strategy? Do you have one mantra or can you give us? I, I do. I do. It's it's not a very popular mantra. I <laughs> I, I tell the team look uh, try to educate, try to entertain, don't try to sell, because the minute there's selling pressure, see. Our category people buy when they like to buy and when they feel happy making a purchase. This is not like you and you know you need toothpaste and it's getting over and you're just you know refilling so it's, it's it's not a, it's an emotional purchase. So our responsibility does not lie in pushing discount coupons on sale sale banners. I mean I can't you can't commoditize such a beautiful industry. Which is why I think my mantra and our team's mantra, actually, you know, my team doesn't agree always, but I try to convince them that, you know, let's not commoditize what we are building so carefully and so consciously. Let's just uh, try to educate and engage the consumer with a lot of content about what you can do with the products, uh, stories behind the products. And when the consumer wants to buy, then we will be in their consideration set and then sales will happen. Uh, the only other thing I'd add to this is that there is a market that wants to touch and feel the product offline. We, it is foolish to say that they are going to disappear and they will all start shopping online. They will be shopping offline. So we have to give the person the freedom to shop from wherever they want to. If they are more comfortable going to the store, it is fine. If they want our store, it is fine. They want to shop on Nika, well and good. doesn't matter. It's just that they have to buy us. They have to choose us. That's all that matters. Channel doesn't matter. Uh, you bring up an interesting point. The the, the entire um, you know omni channel aspect for brands, right? You went in tw we went omni channel in twenty seventeen. Yes. Summer, I guess. Yes. Uh, just can you just start with why back then did you decide and what to go omni channel and what was the consumer response you saw post pandemic? So today. And the reasons for being omnichannel today and 2017 are very different. So 2017, it seemed like there was a divide. There was almost like a class distinction, whether you are a legit beauty brand or whether you are an online brand. I mean, we used to go talk to a lot of uh, industry people and there was this uh, phrase, Acha, aap to online brand. Ho. Matlab, it, it was like this sticker. There was this moniker they were put on you saying that, oh, you are this one of these, you know, discount led online brands that... Uh, you know, sell and then disappear. And then we realized that, you know, people don't give you that space and respect, at least in India of 2017, unless they see you. And that is actually at the core of brand building in India. India is a brand starved market, but trust is very important. People need to see you once, twice, thrice, and see you for one, two, three, four years, not a fly by night operator, to believe that, yes, I can trust and buy from these people and buy from these folks. So I think uh, that was a big push for us. One. Secondly, after, you know, we reached a point wherein we knew advertising, we had done social media, we had done performance marketing, we needed to go on television. Television does not work well unless you have distribution in place. So which is why we said, okay, if I'm spraying and playing like television, I need to have distribution sorted. So if people see, they get reminded saying that, oh, yes, I saw the ad and I can purchase something over here. So, so that, and I think overall, if you look at the market leader, um, they are also now making a strong claim digital or trying to. So I can't sit here and say that, you know, online is my territory because others are going to come and try to eat my territory. So I have to do the same, return the favor, go offline and try to uh, make a play over there. So these, these are a couple of uh, things which helped us decide that, okay, yes, we want to play this game. And post the pandemic, a lot of uh, brands in the space, they started, you know, probably uh, not, you know, shutting their offline stores, Thinking, yes. et cetera. Yeah, so what kept you going? And you know, you, you have 200 stores now across India, right? What kept you going? 
So our first hundred stores were textbook stores. I think the team put in a lot of thought and so you know what I'll tell you. The fact is, first hundred stores we were scared, and because when you're scared, you double check, triple check everything, and the team double check, triple checked everything to ensure that the store, let's say the rent we got, because rent impacts your PNL. The zoning we got, like who's next to us, we were very 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 thorough in that, which is why. Uh, the first hundred, the report card after first hundred was very good. Our stores were uh, operationally breaking even in about four months. Capex break even was happening in about fifteen months. So then we said, okay, this looks great. Let's just expand again. Uh, now with two hundred stores, we know that okay, the cream of the stores I think we are already at. So we now need to be a bit more discerning. But the tailwinds are there. We know that we are able to get walk-ins. Uh, once a person walks in, there is a twenty-minute slot wherein we can engage the consumer. Uh, delight the consumer. So uh, we want to play that game, and we are also very cognizant of the fact that the two brands which sell more makeup in the country than us, both of them don't have their own stores. So it's almost like a separate channel for us, a third hand for us to try and win the race with. So yeah, let's see. And uh, what does uh, you know the share look like? So. Um... D two C versus marketplaces versus your offline store. Can you give me some data or statistics so, around your so, the share you get? So offline, actually, a lot of people may not know this, but offline contributes to a bit more than has shifted over past the half a mark. So if I look at last year's numbers, then around about fifty five percent of our overall complete turnover would be from retail offline, and uh, of the remaining forty five, maybe a twenty twenty five mix between our D two C website and our marketplaces SPU. So, and offline, we are just getting started. I know there are so many stores that we are still not present in. So I see some more headroom there. At the same time, I think we'll be far higher than industry when it comes to digital revenue contribution. So if the online revenue contribution for trade across categories in India is single digit, 8-9%, beauty and in industry, I was reading some is about 15%. I think we are easily going to be double of that, even if you look at four or five years from now. So that's where I see this going. Yeah, and you know, the, I, I read up uh, financial year 2023 has been quite encouraging for you. Yeah. What do you think you did right or better than previous years? The, you know, the FI that just went by, right? Yes. I think a lot of pieces came together. We, uh, we had that the whole television campaign that we did with uh, Ranveer Tamanna really paid off. There was a lot of, uh, you know, talk and awareness about it. Uh, Shark Tank contributed to some awareness overall. Uh, and I think our distribution was hitting that tipping point where people could see an ad and in the next three days see our store somewhere. So that, uh, I think we did, that is one thing we did well. The other thing is uh, we've been trying to see where the brand can extend into different price points. So, uh, some of those bets wherein we've tactically launched a few SQs at a different price point uh, to keep up on, on a very different platform. For example, there are some retailers where we could never go because of their, let's say, price expectations. Uh, by bundling together maybe two kits, we've created exclusive combos which sell on a particular channel, not overall in the market. I think we are getting a bit more nuanced on which product to place in which channel and that's helping us. You know, let's talk about a different aspect. Let's talk about your consumer demographics right now. Yeah. Uh, which demographics, say, age group-wise? Let me get there. Uh, Gen Zs are always up for experimentations. The yes. millennial gang and the older gang, they are more to, you know, what I like, I'll continue with that. What is the trend you're seeing right now? Is this going on or have you seen any sort of change there? We are figuring out Gen Z. As in, as with most brands and most parents and everybody else as to where their interests lie, because it, it's amazing. Because I think Gen Z pushes all brands to be more responsible and true. Because see, we I think we grow up in a you know in a very aspiring or an aspirational uh, generation where we already were told what good brands are. Gen Z is making up their own mind about what a good brand is. Which is why the scary part is like millennials are very, very close to sugar. Gen Z, they are, but we have to take more effort into proving ourselves to Gen Z. The good part is that suddenly 
the gap between a new challenger brand like us and a legacy brand disappears because a gen z audience doesn't care about whether you've been advertising on tv for 20 years they will tell you ask you today kya cha if you are asking me to pay 500 rupees for this product why this over that and which is where uh, you know accommodating their uh, things that they are passionate about like for example there's a uh, foundation stick that we sell um the nearest i know is a competitor who sells 14 different shades amongst indian brands of of that so we have that in 22 different shades and we talk openly about it that you know from uh, you know deep skin tone to medium to light skin tone it's there across the spectrum i think that has played it's in a lot of people in fact face as a category today is almost the same as lips for us which was not the case pre pandemic we can pandemic it was maybe one third that of lips so people are trusting us with more uh, i think uh, higher priced more sensitive purchases and i think it's good for the brand it's the direction we want to take and gender wise do you see a lot of male consumers uh, you know no coming... no i would love to say that you know we are the all sexes brand but no nope. we do have the occasional frantic shopper uh, who uh, does uh, you know splurge on the kit for a gift but i think as a brand we have also not uh, communicated to that audience to say that you know um, there's sugar can play for uh, makeup for men as well and i know that things like concealers which are not very overtly discernible makeup are on the rise in i mean the male audience maybe someday but today i don't think it's a focus area for us right okay okay um fair maybe some day again males will uh, take note of that uh, okay can you give me a look at the brand's media mix right now for your upcoming campaigns or the campaigns you've done recently uh, what does the media mix look like and the spends upcoming you know with the upcoming festive season of course are we expecting a, to see a rise in your uh, marketing spends so this year definitely no but we are but we are not going to maintain the same spend as last year so last year i think we um, i think we spent quite a lot <laughs> but the the thing is let's see when you spend uh, let's say 40 35 40% of your revenue in marketing on a year wherein you know you are in debt investing ahead of time next year when your revenue is double i mean which is what we expect in this year suddenly you realize that your marketing has 20 22% of your overall uh, sales so which is fine which is manageable so they if you look at our mix a large part of it is about one third of it is on television and uh, of the remaining there is a good one third that's on digital which includes performance marketing for our d2c website and also on partner portals like amazon like that yes the remaining one third is purely invested in retail and we continue to believe that in the most crowded of markets you unfortunately need that glow sign board need that standing need that call out to keep reminding people that you know you know sugar is sugar you know keep telling people that and uh, it's it's i don't think it's very aggressive uh, and uh, because the overall company is moving to towards profitability and this year is going to be another big swing towards that i don't see us taking more aggressive bets on this there's a lot of focus on uh, repeat consumers and getting people to come back to the store for a refill purchase or a walk in purchase we are spending effort on that in preference to let's say brute force marketing and more retail marketing so how exactly are you doing that the repeat customers how getting them back how exactly so, are you planning so we've internally you know we are really trying to test a hypothesis to say that in case there's discovery of product that needs to happen it is more likely that the audience will want to go to a store so our duty then is not to push a coupon code for the app is to give the nearest location to, to the person and say you know what hey you can reach there in you know 15 minutes right now this is your nearest store and go check out our product whereas once a person shops with you we do of course can contact them because we have their details replenishment purchases we are trying to drive through the app so if a person shop for a mascara and we know that mascara once you open it six months it'll dry and post that so there is a user journey which we are building in some categories it is already prevalent which says that okay i know your usage pattern is for nine month period or three month period this is how i communicate with you to top it up before you drift off to another brand or forget about it altogether so a lot of these things are yet to play out but is directionally we want to move towards that i think i think that was quite an interesting and insightful chat oh, gosh thank, you. thank, thank you, yes. you so much
Thank you so much for uh, joining us here today at E4MD2C Revolution. Um, and uh, all the best for all your journey and all your lined up activities. Thank you. Thanks, Vani. Thank you. Very Thank much. you, everyone.